All right, everyone. Welcome. We are here on the final day of February, the leap year uh, that we only see once every four years, February 29th, 2024, talking crypto markets here with Trav. Trav, how have things been on your end? Ooh, my, my man, it's been it's been a bit of a roller coaster on here. Being since I've been around here, I know a lot of my friends can relate to this. A lot of people in our community, um, you know, I a lot of us showed up at the beginning of the last bull cycle. So this this feeling, this um, seeing Bitcoin approach its all time highs with nothing really seeming to get in its way is very serendipitous, and it's 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 bringing everything back from the last bull run here. Um, but with that, of course, you know, being in a previous bear or bull cycle, we know that what goes up must come down here. So to bring all that together, I'm feeling fantastic because today we have an opportunity to actually dive underneath the hood and see what's going on behind the scenes here. So Brian, how about you, my friend? How are you feeling today? Yeah, well said, Trav. I, I think the sentiment is the same over here where that sentiment having a lot of conversations internally as well as posting as much content as we can about whether this four and a half month bull cycle can turn into a five, six, seven month bull cycle. I think uh, as usual, the the pump that we've seen is pretty unexpected because that's generally how crypto markets work. And right now we are anticipating some major polarization, probably some of the biggest we've we've seen in a long time, maybe since late 2021, where it's going to like a huge surge of people that are ultra bullish, you know, diamond hands, whatever they like to call themselves. While there's another contingency saying like, should have never gone this high, way too much FOMO. Um, the ETFs are over exaggerated in terms of their impact. So as usual, you know, most of us believe that the truth lies somewhere in between. And uh, I'm having a lot of fun just figuring it all out and looking at, you know, all of the anecdotal evidence on the Twitter feeds and seeing what people are saying and then comparing that to like the actual objective data out there that's showing like numerically how many people are bullish versus bearish. I think, you know, sentiments got so much cool data on that stuff that you don't see anywhere else. 100%, 100%. And on that note with, uh, with the sentiment tools, you know, um, contributing to this experience that we're we're all in right now of seeing the markets just soar, uh, it's been that's been the one key difference between this bull cycle and last bull cycle. On top of all of the other experiences in building and building and and connections and all of this, that really makes this specific cycle unique because now we have such a clear understanding of the truth behind these moves and what money is actually doing as price skyrockets to Valhalla as it's been here. So Brian, I have I have a couple questions that I was hoping that we could answer here and I'm gonna shoot them your way and you can let me know what you think here. First of all, where in the bull cycle are we? Can this keep going? And if not, is does it mean the end of the bull run or does it mean a short to midterm correction before heading back up in the same direction here? So what, what do you think might be a great place to start to be able to answer these questions and to provide some clarity to everyone else in our communities who have the exact same burning question, looking for results anywhere they possibly can? Yeah, I'm going to share my screen here as I give my answers. Um, let me know if you can see this okay on your end, by the way, Trav. Absolutely, my friend. I've got it popped up Excellent. here. Are you able to see it well? Yep, yep. All's good here. So to answer that first part, you know, where are we in the bull cycle? Um, obviously, the definition of what is a bull market, what is a bull cycle, it, there's no objective answer to that. If we've been pumping or going up for four and a half straight months, going back to mid-October like we have been, yeah, we can, I'd say 98% of people out there are going to agree that we've been in some semblance of a bull cycle. But um a lot of people use that term as a justification to just pour in more money, add on to their positions, hold their positions, no matter how much or how little prices are going up. And I think that's the wrong way of looking at it. There's no, I, I should say there is truth to, 
you know, analyzing markets based on support and resistance levels. I, I do believe in TA. I think there's a ton of great analysts out there who can very precisely target levels and call the tops like within 1% extremely well. And it's super impressive. I certainly can't do that. And, and that's why we don't do TA. We do fundamental analysis, but we absolutely still have, you know, RSI volume and a few other things on on sentiment that does kind of overlap with what the, the great TA traders do. What we do is we identify on any given day or any given week how euphoric or how fearful people are getting. And we combine that with how the large key stakeholders, particular, particularly in Bitcoin, but it goes for any, any network out there, how they're behaving at any given time. And generally markets go the same direction as the latter, how the, the big key whales and sharks are behaving and how they're accumulating or dumping at any given time. They go the opposite direction, typically, not always, of the crowd's expectation. So, for example, the ETFs, which I think we talked about uh, on our last call, as it was happening, everybody expected, you know, the minute those ETFs were approved by the SEC, we're going to 50K and beyond, maybe challenging the all-time high. Well, eventually, that's almost certainly going to be true. Not investment advice, of course, but we can objectively say that seven weeks after they were approved, here we are at 64K uh, or a high of 64K about 24 hours ago from the time of this recording. Um, but initially, those, those three to five days after the approvals happened, everybody seemed to get bamboozled and the prices went the opposite direction until the crowd started to turn on that ETF being bullish narrative that was out there and they started to get fearful and then boom, we, we have liftoff with the crypto markets. So people got faked out twice, right? So what we're looking for right now and we'll discuss on this call is are people finally showing the euphoria, the, the um, lack of uncertainty or lack of doubt in the markets that generally is synonymous with a top? We saw denial throughout 2021 um, especially, so if you remember 2021, you were in the markets back back at that time, right? Or at least monitoring how they were fluctuating? I was indeed, yes. Yeah, so 2021 was obviously the, the big, you know, shocker of a year where we saw the eventual all-time high of just below 69K for Bitcoin. And this was only a year after uh, COVID rocked the world and and shook everyone and made people think crypto might be over. In hindsight, that was a bit of a silly misconception. But um, in 2021, we got this big all-time high, then all-time high in April. Then in the summer, we dip and everyone freaks out. Uh, and then we see slowly but surely as it rises back up until it eventually reaches that November 10th, 2021 all-time high, we see people get more and more euphoric and the fear just dissipates. People just become confidently sure that Bitcoin's gonna go up indefinitely. And then everyone has the rug pulled. What we've been looking for specifically over these past couple weeks, even as far back as when the ETFs were approved is, are people getting that irrational sense of comfort that is usually synonymous with markets uh, hitting their top and suddenly causing a bunch of people pain, right? So uh, from my perspective, we are at the very tail end of that. We're finally starting to see a whole lot of irrational confidence, especially where people are putting their money where their mouth is, not just in terms of people typing the word bullish all over the internet. We're looking at actual Funding rates, which this is not a, a um, one color graph, right? This is a red, yellow, and green graph where red indicates a lot of longing, yellow indicates neutral, and green indicates shorting when it comes to funding rate. When it's nothing but red here, that means all of these altcoins that are labeled here on the x-axis are longed 
more than shorted right now in terms of their funding rate ratio when factoring in um, Binance, BitMEX, and I believe we're including DYDX and Deribit in this as well. So it's taking the average funding rates of all of these. And if they're showing signs of greed, they're going to show up red. All of them are red right now. Wow. Uh, that's a concern to me. It doesn't mean like precisely at the time of this video, we're about to turn and go the other direction. I actually wouldn't be shocked if there's still a challenge of 65K in the near future or even the 68, 69K all time high. I would be shocked if it went far beyond that, um, considering the amount of greed. But the more likely scenario, since we deal with these things in probability form, is that we see a bit of a dip potentially below 60, which could come as soon as today, since we're challenging that 60K level. And we probably range in that 57 to 62 K range until another news break happens of some sort. And uh, then we potentially go lower or higher from there. But what usually needs to happen is these longing funding rates need to get somewhat liquidated and the average trading returns as displayed on this chart need to get back to neutral. Orange and red here indicate that these coins are either semi overbought or overbought according to the average returns among multiple time frames for traders that have been active over the past year. So wow. that's that's how I'm seeing it right now. I know it's a long winded answer, but it's a tough one to just succinctly say, yes, we're at the top. Yes, we're at the bottom. Probability says based on history, we're in that danger zone right now. Um, so profit taking is more justified than usual if you if you want to take that how you will yeah there's some dramatic findings that you're showing us right now and i know from previous calls and then of course from using sentiment and sandbase now for for several months um you've shown time and time again how through a statistical analysis um through tons of back testing that uh, indicators like the mvrv funding rates and um a few other solid ones here um, the the correlation that they have with market movement and predicting certain outcomes is pretty is pretty effective here. So to see you know all of the funding rates on all the different um, exchanges be so you know a bullish bias oriented, uh, see seeing it all red like um, like you showed in the last graph here, and then seeing um, the MVRV on this specific graph seeing that so many people on so many coins are all in so much profit. Um, I think just looking at it from a, a logical standpoint, you know, people are only going to stay in the green and have that be pushed so long before that temptation to take profits. is just going to supersede everything else. And they're just going to pack up and run here. So this, this is, this is very telling. This is very, um, this is very helpful. This, this has given me a ton of, um uh clarity and 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 not i'm, I'm not gonna use the word certainty because that's uh, I'm, that nothing of course is certain in the crypto world but this definitely already helps answer those questions now there's one other um topic here and, I, and i'm sure you've got a, a few other things that you want to speak about at the moment but while i was doing my own due diligence using the sentiment or the sandbase app i was taking a look at whale holdings and I saw something pretty dramatic actually for the 1,000 to 10,000 uh, Bitcoin wallets that only appeared within the last 12 to 24 hours here. I was wondering, did you see that? And We um, just posted about it. I, I think this okay. is exactly what you're talking about. So we saw a big swap in 100 to 1K BTC wallets and 1K to 10K BTC wallets where there's this giant accumulation of the former and giant dump of the latter. Is that what you're referring to? You got it. Yeah. No, I was looking kind of, kind of like the mega sharks were the ones that had up to, I believe it was 10,000 BTC in their in their wallets. And it just took a it was trending up like crazy. Um, just you could tell that they were accumulating supply in the wallets. The number of people who had that much uh, Bitcoin in their wallets was skyrocketing. And then it just tanked. And it was it was shocking to see, actually. Yeah, let's take a look at the, the interactive chart here. So uh, whenever we put out posts, by the way, we'll, we'll give a little insight with the chart. And then at the bottom, 
uh, you'll typically see the actual link. So you can just revisit it anytime you'd like. Uh, and what we see at the moment, just as you're referring to here, Trav, since January 22nd, so we'd say roughly five weeks have passed from then until the top of the top on the 26th, that tier of 1K to 10K BTC wallets accumulated a massive 236.3K Bitcoin, or in other words, about 5% more uh, that were initially in their wallets. So that, that's a massive, massive climb. In the meantime, the 100 to 1K was going the opposite direction, and they dropped uh, 186.8K, which is not quite as much. So obviously, if we merge those together and we just looked at 110K, uh, the line would be climbing up a little. But generally, the larger of the two, you want that to go up more so than the, the other, uh, because these are whales. These, as you referred to them, are more like high-end sharks. Still millionaires, for sure. Uh, but they are, they're not as quite uh, key stakeholders as the larger wallet, for obvious reasons. So when you see that we suddenly have a flip-flop and a big one at that all in one day, yeah, that's a concern because the uh, this essentially tells us that the large, the actual whales, 1K to 10K, they are either splitting their wallets into a few smaller ones. Usually that has a lot to do with selling or they're just they're just dumping straight out. Uh, I, I would I would think it's probably the former because you wouldn't see this green line go up in unison if they weren't just breaking them into smaller but still very big wallets relative to most wallets out there. That makes a ton of sense. That makes a ton of sense. And then just to add some more context and and maybe I'll ask you for some clarification um, on why this is so relevant here. Um, just correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the reason that we look at the the massive whales is because, of course, it's this amount of liquidity that it takes to um, catalyze these massive movements in the market. Having somebody buy and sell one Bitcoin um, here and there, that's really not going to affect the the impact of price um, at all. That's going to be visible on on any sort of chart. It's it's not until you have hundreds of millions of USD worth of Bitcoin, um, you know, being bought or sold simultaneously. That's when you have the massive swings and that's when you have the massive pivots that happen in, in market cycles here. Does that sound about right? Yeah, that's fair to say. Like if if we talk about 1K to 10K wallets, because of the anonymity of crypto and especially Bitcoin, like Ethereum is a little more transparent, for example, but Bitcoin it's pretty tough to find out what is considered an exchange wallet versus a non-exchange wallet. Uh, plenty of people do the, the research and, and find specific wallets and, and can trace them, but doing all of them at once on any given day is a tough task. But we do know that a, a very good portion of these are liquidity wallets that belong to exchanges for the purpose of making sure that there's minimal slippage and anyone who wants to make a market or limit order at any time can do so instantly when that price hits. Um, so we usually stop at 1K to 10K in terms of actual active wallets because we've back tested and estimated that anything over 10K is going to be almost exclusively belonging to exchanges or wallets that barely ever make moves from you know, Satoshi himself and maybe a few Winklevi brothers out there, who knows? We're not here to speculate, but 10K to basically any wallet that's 10K and above, you'll notice they actually hold less collective Bitcoin than uh, 100 to 1K or 1K to 10K especially. Uh, so these two make up two thirds of the entire supply. And this wow. one's more like call it one sixth, maybe one seventh of the total supply. Uh, and we exclude 10K plus for that reason, because it's just not indicative of price levels very much. You don't get a lot of good alpha from looking at them. Um, but we do generally see a correlation with anywhere between 10 to 10K. So if I merge all three of those together and you just look at this blue line right here, let's just pin it with the same axes. Ah, we'll just get rid of the other three altogether. So this is just 10 to 10K wallets. 
you'll notice they're still up. They're they're looking okay overall. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a pretty nice correlation. Look at, especially since the beginning of the year, they go down, so does the price. They start accumulating, price goes up. They start going down, price goes down again. And then they have this tiny little lift off. I mean, that's still massive, but you know, for the chart purposes, it doesn't look that big. And then we see this giant takeoff that arguably goes a little higher than the rest of the correlation here. So that's why it looks a little bit concerning that we see a, a mini little accumulation relatively, whereas the price takes off way higher than any of their previous mini accumulations that were kind of correlated. So that to me looks like a slight bearish divergence uh, and, and it's perplexing as to why prices went as high as that did. Obviously ETFs and other things are contributing and that's kind of my theory. But um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how we do shark and whale analysis. Awesome. No, that, that's really helpful to see. And I, I appreciate how there's a couple of things that I'm taking away from this specific chart that you, you've mentioned and I'll just summarize here. The first is that um, on many occasions, you can actually see the accumulation by the sharks and whales begin just slightly before the actual uptick in price. So that's really helpful um, um, to, to start off with. The second thing is um, that that bearish divergence that you're speaking of, where price is going up, but the uh, the 10 to 10,000 BTC um, shark slash whale category holdings is starting to go down. That is another important takeaway here. And if we look back on this specific time frame, we can see how, you know, often that is correlated with with a drop in price too. So yeah, this is really helpful, Brian. I appreciate yeah. that. And um, I want to ask as well here, um, on the topic of ETFs, do you have any data to help, you know, explain to us what exactly is going on with the ETF right now and how it's kind of playing into everything that's happening with the Bitcoin price? Yeah, let's take a look. We posted about the ETFs two days ago as it was making uh, then all-time high in volume. And it's since been surpassed each of the past two days since we made that post. So if I hit the refresh button here, you'll see that today, or I should say yesterday, it finally cooled off. But you can see on February 25th, 26th, and 27th, we had successive all-time all -time highs on each of these days for volume. Um, and then in terms of like inflow versus outflow, that's where I think people get a little confused because they see volume and they go, okay, there's just tons and tons of money pouring in. Well, that's, as we know, that's not what volume is. That's just showing the overall amount of money that's being moved, whether it's a buy or a sell or anything in between. So inflow wise, it actually doesn't look as good as it sounds. Uh, we had a good inflow day, it appears, for FBTC. IBIT has been more, uh, let's see if it even refreshes. Now, we, we have delay, we have lagging data, so I can't show that for IBIT. But we can see grayscales continuing to just get outflows, which makes sense. That's the old news ETF that's been around since 2015. And then we have FBTC that's kind of had neutral, and yesterday was actually... Uh, a negative inflow day. So that meant a lot of money was moving out of it today or yesterday, I should say. Yesterday was the 28th, the day before was 27th. The 28th had a big inflow day once again, but you can see it's kind of bouncing up and down. So even with all this increased volume, they're not all just positive days of cash moving in. And I could even, you know, eyeball this and just look at the past week since the 21st, and it looks like a little more money's moved out than moved in. That's fascinating because all, all I've all I've really seen or heard in conversations throughout different communities is that you know B, the the ETFs are nothing but um, bullish catalysts for um, for Bitcoin and the crypto market in general. But you I know, agree, putting a, by the way, I, I still think that's okay. true. Uh, they are bullish catalysts. They are objectively uh, bringing in more money from traditional investors who never previously wanted to touch crypto. So their point is true. Uh, but sorry, I didn't mean to interject on that. Go ahead and finish your point. Oh, no, perfect. That was, um, that, that really helps kind of gain that clarity that I'm looking for as well here is that, 
Um, and I agree, you know, from a, um, a general macro sense, um, I'm I'm very pro uh, ETS for the most part. Uh, I still have a lot of questions that I like answered that, especially with the, the halving coming up and, um, you know, what's happening with kind of the just overall accumulation by these ETFs and the impact that may have on the entire Bitcoin market here. But from a macro sense, you know, um, mass adoption has a lot of incredible opportunity for Bitcoin and crypto investors. Um, so uh, I, I'm very much pro bullish on that. I guess the point that I was trying to make was it's it's fascinating to have this next layer of context to know that yeah we've had a ton of record setting volume with all these etfs but there's more of that story that's being illuminated here so um yeah that's context that's is important fascinating very much so very much so and keep in mind that was just fbtc by the way and other etfs may look better you can see bit b uh we kind of had degraded data after the 13th but there was this huge outflow i'm not sure what the deal is with this ETF at the moment, but there are other ETFs that look a lot more positive, like uh, HODL, which is the Van Eck Bitcoin Trust ETF. And they've consistently been bringing in, uh, just looking at the past few days here, uh, 5.8 million inflow on the 20th, 11.5 on the 22nd, 6.4 on the 26th, 6.6 on the 27th. So there's still some ETFs that are just getting more and more popular. Uh, I'd love in the future, uh, once I, I work with the devs here, we can talk about showing an overall inflow outflow because mm -hmm. I think comparing that on the same chart as, the, as this overall volume chart would be invaluable to the entire community. I'm so glad you said that because that's where my mind was wandering as well yeah. here. I'm also bullish to know that uh, it's the HODL ETF that's still you know gaining the traction. Um, you know, bit of a sidebar tangent here. Um, I wonder if it's the name in specific that's um, that's that's resonating most with uh, with potential investors. Uh, but also, that's the the one ETF that I chose to buy one share in as well. So you're Good welcome, you. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> perfect, perfect, excellent, Brian. So we we've been chatting here for about uh, roughly just over half an hour now. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to double check with you to see if there was any other important metrics that you wanted to highlight today and uh, or if there was any other um, special or specific points that you wanted to touch on. I mean, you know me, I could honestly go on forever. Um, I do want to mention a few of our recent insights that kind of recap our, our strongest talking points in the market right now. Uh, we touched on the whales and sharks. We also had uh, this post. So this is big. As of yesterday, yesterday was the biggest on-chain day in terms of our key metrics like uh, on-chain transaction volume, overall circulation, which is the amount of unique tokens being moved, and the amount of whale transactions that exceed $1 million in value. So if, if it's a $1 million transaction, that's considered this high-end whale transaction. If it's $900,000, that wouldn't qualify. But counting all of those, 3,661 separate $1 million plus transactions occurred yesterday, which was the highest day since 2022. Uh, all of these metrics, all three of them here in these bullet points, highest day we've seen since 2022. So that's a massive uh, explosion in on-chain activity, and more importantly, this often correlates with profit taking. So far, this metric looks to be very valuable because this happened as the uh, price hit 64k, not precisely on the hour, but on the same day we saw 64k market value. We quickly see a retrace the next day. So we'll see whether this ends up being telling of the local top uh, for 2024. Uh, I wouldn't say the entire year, but maybe for a few weeks, maybe even a few months going into the halving, I'm not gonna predict, but this often is associated with tops. You can even see previously, proofs in the pudding. This happened as the ETFs were announced. Everyone got euphoric, tons of transactions, people pulling their Bitcoin off the blockchain and putting their money in ETFs, you know? And suddenly we see this drop that goes on for about a week and a half, two weeks here before we finally get this climb after the on-chain chain activity normalizes. That is fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm in awe 
but also I'm left with a sense of um, foreboding as well, considering mm -hmm. this, because, because a couple of things. First of all, uh, knowing that that trillions of dollars worth of transactions occurred on that one specific day is just more than I could possibly comprehend. That's absolutely wild. Secondly, this brings me back to one of our previous conversations where we spoke specifically about volume and the correlations those historically have had with uh, with markets, uh, tops and pivots and, and all of these different things. And that was the main takeaway from that conversation is that when you see massive, gigantic spikes in volume, and right now we are seeing one of the, like a massive record setting day of volume, that yeah. often can indicate in a bull cycle, a terminal volume situation where everyone now has identified this as the top, it's time to take profits and price may eventually turn here. So uh, I very much find value in this one and I appreciate you sharing this one with, with us here. Yeah, totally. I mean, there's the cool thing about markets having this kind of volatility is you just see so many anomalies in the data that you can, you can capitalize on. I think Mark Cuban, whether you love him or hate him, he uh, he's been known to say in interviews when people ask him about investing, when do you when do you make your moves uh, and become most active in the markets? And he says, I, I pretty much do nothing until volatility goes nuts, meaning I wait for prices to either go way up in what I'm investing in or way down. And that's when I make my moves. Anything that's small or in between, just leave it alone. And I think these these metrics finally exploding to one, two, five-year highs in some cases, uh, that's indicating that there's some opportunities that are emerging for the people paying attention. 100%. And, and I'm so glad that you brought that up as well, because this has been another message that I've been trying to communicate um, to my, my community here now for a while, is that there's nothing worse than having that feeling of, of going into a position blind. It what helps combat greed and fear, which of course have been shown to be the the um, the top um, portfolio killers essentially, is coming in with an informed um, an informed thought out uh, trading thesis. And I mean, from what we've been covering today, and from my own personal experience, using um, these metrics that we're we're going over today has helped. Just it helped. It's helped me kind of approach this space with a much more objective, uh, peaceful approach, which more than anything, I'm, I'm the most appreciative of. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, I'm just going to end that thought right there yeah. here. But, um, so what, what are we looking at now here, Brian? What, uh, can you tell us what's happening at the moment? Yeah, I wanted to make this final point, um, just in terms of the correlation between crypto, uh, and the S and P, uh, which, for about two years now, has had a pretty tight correlation if you uh, look at the past couple of years. So if I go back, let's get the, the month right. So February 20, nope, there was no leap year in 2022. There we go. So if I go look, go look at two years and I just look at Bitcoin versus the S&P, you quickly notice there's actually a pretty tight correlation. You know, stocks and equities go down, so does crypto. Stocks and equities go up, so does crypto. Obviously, these are wildly different percentages and they're on their own axes. Uh, but a lot of people have been saying for the last couple of years, Bitcoin is essentially kind of like a high leveraged tech stock and it's fluctuating the same way that something on NASDAQ would. Um, and they were kind of right. I mean, mathematically, it's kind of true. Bitcoin was just moving up quicker than the S&P when things were good and going down quicker when things were not good. And there were a few anomalies like our, our uh, infamous friend, uh, I should not say friend, yikes, I don't know the guy at all, but S SBF um, and that whole collapse with FTX really impacted crypto and there was a huge separation with equities here, but crypto eventually caught up. This ended up being essentially the local bottom. And we just took off ever since uh, for about 14, 15 straight months now. Um, but what's interesting now, I mean, if we really just look at, we'll just say the last month, uh, the price of Bitcoin has certainly exploded. And yes, the S&P has as well, but 
if I just hold down shift on the sentiment chart and you look at the top left bubble there, the S&P is up about 3.9%, Bitcoin's up 40.5%. And wow. this latest explosion just in the past two and a half days, this happened without the S&P's help. Uh, going back to February 26th, around midnight Pacific time, Bitcoin's up 19%. The S&P 500 is actually just a fingernail down. So that tells me that crypto is relying less on how real world companies are doing right now. And historically, bull markets are most likely to occur when there is no correlation between the two. Some people think they need to have op opposite correlations. Backtesting says that's not true, actually. Just no reliance at all is usually ideal. And at least for the, the short term here in the second half of February, I guess, there has been no correlation, which is a, a pretty promising sign that we could be in a long-term bull cycle, even if we see a short-term correction. Uh, that, I, I appreciate that we're coming to the to near the end of this uh, of this call here, uh, talking about this specific indicator, um, because I think that's while there may be a short to mid-term uh, bearish change of character um, on Bitcoin, um, I appreciate that in the long term we do have a bit more of a, a brighter bullish, um, um, I guess, potential of things just carrying on once things cool off a little bit. And there was one other metric that I took a look at, and I cannot believe that I am forgetting the name of it, but we've covered it before in previous calls. Um, as I can describe it to you, it was essentially the indicator that described the dormancy versus activity of Bitcoin and how um, it's, it's more of a long term indicator. And when it starts curling and starting to yep. dip, there we go. Perfect. So this is mean dollar invested age, which essentially the measures one. the average age in which assets have been sitting in all of the Bitcoin wallets out there. Uh, and when we blend that all together right now, the average age is 580, which is a much smaller number than where we were right at the start of the bull rally in the third week of October when it was at about 639 days. Uh, historically, if we go back, let's say, we'll just go back all the way to 2016. So these drops here have historically been when bull markets are at their best. Uh, you can see how well they coincide. And there's a bit of alpha to it too. It's not just a, a justifier. This is like, you start to see the mean dollar invested age drop here in like November or December of 2016. Then by the time it's really free falling, you see that the price is exploding because it's all of these formerly stagnant coins that are being injected back into public circulation for everyday traders to exchange with one another. And that's how networks grow and market caps grow over time. More utility is absolutely a great, uh, a great thing for crypto. Perfect. Good. I'm, uh, I, I appreciate that uh, there is still a long term positive sentiment when it comes to Bitcoin and crypto at large. Um, so here's my, my final question for you, Brian, actually, is I'll leave it at this. Uh, we, we've covered a lot today. We've um, we've dove into uh, several key metrics that spoke directly to what's happening on chain, what's happening with the money, and then also what's happening with the sentiment. If you had to leave us now with a couple of our main takeaways, what would you what would you like to say? Yeah, um, on a daily basis, definitely monitor what the crowd is doing. We'll give you guys links. Just follow sentiments. Uh, Twitter feed or, or go to insights.sentiment.net and you'll see us updating what the crowd is doing, especially when they start to veer toward too greedy or too fearful. Watch that closely, like literally every day, see if an anomaly comes. And if you see it, you'll be one of the first to recognize when there's going to be a turning point, either going back down below 60 or potentially heading up to 65. It's likely going to depend on the amount of greed or fear that the, you know, peons, the small wallets out there are uh, are feeling, and then combine that with with those 
large whales and sharks and how they're behaving because they're going to be the guide in terms of the correct direction that prices are going to go. If they are continuing to dump, look out and uh, profit taking is probably pretty justified. Uh, but as always, just trade with with pragmatism and logic. Try to avoid emotion. I'm sure you've heard it many times. Uh, and don't invest your life savings because when you do, it's impossible to be pr pragmatic or logical in the first place. Well said. Again, that's these, these are messages that I've been trying to find different ways to communicate since day one in this space. Having gone through many of those experiences myself of blindly putting money into different assets, losing it all, and of course, things like getting scammed and getting rugged. But I do believe it all comes down to building confidence um, in why you're trading to begin with and having a tool like Santiment that delivers such well interpreted on chain data and shows you know, all of the um, the back testing and data that actually supports um, the the findings through this data is has been just an incredible way to actually achieve this and, and find, that piece, find that confidence to make the most out of the crypto space here. So. Brian, I just want to thank you for taking the time here. This has been another very important, very constructive conversation that I've had with you. And um, to finish her off, any last words that you'd like to leave us with? No, I love it, Trav. This was a blast. I appreciate the questions and the insights that you have as always. And I'm already looking forward to the next one. You said it, my friend. Excellent. Right back at you. And to everyone who took some time to hang out with us today, I just want to send you guys some love. Thank you for hanging out with us. Thank you for being part of this conversation. And if any of you guys have any further questions or comments or feedback, feel free to send either of us a DM here and um, we'll make sure that we can get you the best possible alpha we can here. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day and be safe out there. Cheers, guys.